Hi everyone, Niall here. Welcome back to the 820 BIM channel. Today we're going to talk about nine steps you can take to start pretty much every Revit project um, in kind of a, a controlled and rhythmic manner. Um, this is really for people who don't have access to high quality office templates, to office standards, to a BIM coordinator or BIM manager who they can bounce ideas about how to set up per project specific models. This really is just a generic step set of very basic steps that any user can undertake to meaningfully get started before they model in such a way that they will be able to, let's say, coordinate externally without issue. And to be honest with you, they won't look like a horse's ass. Um, and also just kind of give a proper framework to every project and a rhythmic, rhythmic set of steps so that they kind of have the framework in place every time automatically. Um, so this isn't a model generation tutorial. This is not a template generation tutorial. It's, it's, it's much more rudimental than that. It's a series of initial steps when you get into the Revit environment to get your project up and running meaningfully. So as always, if you like this content, you know what to do down below. Hit the like and subscribe. I will have a download to this model once it's complete. Um, by complete, I mean the framework is complete so that you can go and uh, have a look at that and analyze that as you wish as well. That will be in the link below. Okay, um, so as always, I hope you enjoy. Leave a comment below if I've missed any steps that you like to integrate, just to make sure other users can consider them as well. And uh, I'll see you for the next one as well. Okay, let's get into it. So step one is how to create your project from scratch. Okay, and um, the reality is you need to ensure that you have access to whatever template you should be using if you're working in an office environment. Okay, so if you're working in an office or you're working from, let's say, you're, you're a college student, Make sure you talk to the people, the BIM coordinators or your department head or whoever it may be who's responsible for the template information to ensure that you're starting the project with the correct template for your specific discipline. Okay, I would recommend when you create a project that you always go per discipline. Try not to create an amalgamated model of all disciplines. Very, very few projects really work with all disciplines integrated. What you really should have is each individual discipline as a distinct model that are all interlinked and coordinated in uh, basically geolocated relative to one another and correctly on site. Okay, so that's the ideal workflow. And um, you know, unless we're talking about something like a garden shed, I really don't think you should ever really integrate all your disciplines into one model environment. Okay, so that's one consideration for you. Okay, and um, so look, if you have access to a high quality template, an office template, a university template, whatever it may be, please ensure that you're working with that when you start. If not, the Autodesk generic ones are absolutely perfect to get you started with, and we're going to work with one of them here now, okay? So, as I said, pick your discipline. So, on screen here, we're going to go to New Project, and in this instance, I'm going to pick the Construction Template. You can pick Architectural Template, Structural, or Mechanical. I'm actually going to pick the Architectural Template for this, and press OK. And, as you can see, we've already started a new project file, okay? What I would say to you is, if for any reason you have problems with your installation in Revit, you don't have that drop down list from your template locations, I have a little video coming up in the eye in the corner there that goes through in depth where you can find all the default information for Revit families that come with the, the installation, uh, system families, um, template file locations, all of that kind of stuff. It's very long, it's very inclusive, it's definitely informative, but you can just go to the, it's all time stamped. You can go to the subsection that you need to find the templates just so you can redirect the file path in case there's any problems with your file install okay so moving on so step two is to assign your project information this is something i see missed all the time people just they get straight into the model and they the first thing they do is they start drawing their walls and their floors and everything and they've never actually taken the time to implement the project information um, and really it's it's not a lot there are a couple of, of text-based families that are populated with some project specifics okay if you're working on a high high-end template you will have a splash screen whenever you open the model and that splash screen will be populated with all of the project information as a start so the first thing you do on the splash screen is you enter in the project information okay and um, in this instance obviously we're using the default template so that's not readily available to you so i'm going to go through where some of that information is on the drawing sheets at least so you can front end that and that means you're actually embedding that project information as well at the same time. The one thing to know is just kind of the nature of things that are typically included in the project information. So you normally have the project name, the project number, the project client, the project location information. So 
you will have an address but you may want also want to include some of the geolocation information if you have that present at the start of the project but it should definitely be introduced after the information is received at least off-site and then you might have various notes such as um let's say sharing uh criteria for external design stakeholders for example or model license information that if you share it you put in contingencies what people are allowed to do and what people are not allowed to do with this model um, you may also have certain things like standard notes that you like to implement and have um, let's say a couple of let's say standard specification sheets depending on the discipline okay so they're just considerations to implement front end into your model and make sure that each model has them present okay uh, if you're developing a template it's something you should include as a splash screen with all that information it really makes life easier if you're working off the template that we have in front of us here now at the moment if you just go to the sheets data here you can see that we at least have the project name the project title and the client already there okay and we can implement this so we can say um we can call this uh apologies oh my god <laughs> This is just all notion. This is made up off the top of my head. Um, so this is, um, we're going glamorous with a warehouse and the client owner is, um, okay. So as you can see, but understand that these parameters here, these are project wide parameters. So although I'm only populating them on the sheet here, there are actually there are other ways to implement these in, but just if this is the data you're working off of, that's the easiest way, okay? Go in, get that information correct front end, okay? So step three is when we actually start populating some information into the model beyond just text-based information, and that is to implement your grids, okay? So regardless of the scale of the project, I firmly believe that all projects should have grids appended to them. Um, I don't care if you're if it's again a, a small blockwork shed or if it's a blockwork residential or a, a, just a standard um, construction residential building without necessarily column and beam systems or even if it's something akin to an organic kind of um a, a more um conceptual design that has a lot of organic forms that have been generated there is still a grid that can be applied and a sense applied to that project and grids should always be implemented. So even if you don't have um, column structures, you should still align grids to, let's say, the core center line of your wall buildup. Um, this is just good practice. It should be implemented in every project. So I am just going to go through a very quick creation process for grids, okay? Just so you know um, the, the, the fundamentals, okay? So if you go to the structure tab, you will see we have grid over here under the datum subsection. This is also available in the architecture grid datum so you can pick your poison here okay you can also use the short key gr and that will pick up the grid line okay and now using the first line draw tool you click and drag okay what you can do is you notice that only one bubble is open okay and the other is closed you can actually click here to turn on the other button bubble or turn it off or if you want as a default both bubbles to be shown in every instance you can go into edit type and your plan view symbols end one you can turn on and end two you can leave on and you will see that will automatically populate you can also and i recommend this always change the first um the, the first uh, iteration that you place let's say the first grid bubble so i'm just going to turn this to a for the moment so you can see it because when i begin to copy this into intervals now you can array and there's other means of, of of copying here but using the standard copy i'm going to press multiple i'm going to go down 6000 okay and you'll see that it'll automatically populate with b and for it again i'm going to go down to 6000 again and you can see c okay and then again i'm going to press gr to go in the opposite direction you'll notice that's probably going to incorrectly populate d now because we don't want that okay but I'm going to change again that first value to one and then I'm going to copy and we're going to do 5500 oh, in this direction and I'm just going to continue that process all the way down and if I want I could speed things up and just go line to line okay so I'm going to extend that out a little bit there and now I'm just going to grab my elevation markers and just move them into a neater position 
just outside the extents of the grids and centralize them. And note that your elevation marker shows the full width, so you're not missing anything there. Okay? So that's how to set up the grids initially. The thing to note is that um, you have to ensure that your grids are working in all three axes. So we've only set up our grids in the two axes there. But what we should also do is we should go to our northern elevation. And you can see that our grids are currently going across the height of the levels. So they're, they're high enough across the project as it stands. But we're going to introduce more levels to this project. So I'm going to bring the grids way up and I'm also going to reduce them down so they go beyond the foundation level and we also need to do the same on the reverse elevations so on our east-west direction as well we need to ensure that our grids are sufficiently high for the project okay and finally if you want and you don't want any active edits to happen on your grids you can select all your grids and if you're happy that they're confirmed in the short term or you don't want anyone to be, have the capacity to accidentally click and drag them, you can press PN and that will pin the grids. Okay. Alternatively, when you have the selection available, you can see that the unpin is there and that button pin is below. Okay. So that will stop anyone accidentally clicking or dragging or altering the grids. The grids should be relatively static for a project. Um, so I recommend you do that front end. Okay, so that's step three, setting up your grids. So step four is to set up our levels. Okay, so as you saw on the, um, the, the previous point, we were in this plan view here, okay? And if I go to the south elevation, you can see that we have uh, two existing levels already present as a default in the, in the template that we're using. Again, if you're using a different template, you're gonna have a different arrangement, okay? But these levels are not necessarily pertinent to the design model that we need to generate. So I'm gonna start editing them, okay? And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to rename level zero as to ground floor, okay? Now you can see we get prompted, would you like to rename the corresponding views? So this, again, is a criteria that may be dictated by an office standard, or you may want as an individual if you're working as an individual. So some offices would like you to have your views and your levels with the same naming convention so that the views reference the level succinctly and intelligently, okay? But that being said, it's not very workable. It becomes kind of difficult as the project develops and you have multiple duplicates of the same view. The association can get kind of loose then anyway, okay? So it really is a choice matter whether or not you want your levels and your views to correspond to one another. Because this is a tutorial video, I want people to understand specifically what they're looking at. So in this instance, I'm going to say yes. I'm going to rename the corresponding views to the levels that they are associated with. Similarly, here, I'm going to relabel this to first floor. Okay, I'm gonna press yes, okay. So, that's the first thing we've done is we've relabeled the existing views that we have, okay. As before with the grids, you can see that we only have our marker on one end and not the other. We do have this little checkbox at the end that we can show the bubble, yes or no, okay. And as you can see, when I move one, one level, all the levels move, okay. And the idea is, you see this little lock and this dash line? This is showing that the node is connected to the node below and it keeps all your levels tied into one another in plane, okay? If I turn that off, it'll move it independently, okay? I wouldn't recommend that. Try keep your level locked for presentation per uh, purposes and you will see it just keeps things nice and neat, okay? Finally, if you want as a default, the level indicator to be on both sides of your drawing on all your elevations and sections. Again, you can go into your type and you can put your symbol at each end and press OK. All right. So now that we have updated the existing levels, we're going to create a couple of new levels. OK. So again, in the structure or the architecture tab, you will see we have a datum. OK. And under datum, we have level and grid because we're in elevation. Level is now present to us. It wasn't in the plan view earlier on. So we can click here or we can use the shortcut key LL and that'll bring up our level function. Okay. And here I'm going to put in one level. I'm going to put in another level and another one on top. And finally, I'm going to put one in down here. Now, again, this is obviously project specific. Okay. 
So I'm doing a commercial project in this instance, and um, the floor to floor is approximately about 37.50, okay? So I'm gonna change the first floor to 37.50, and then here, it's gonna be 7,500, okay? And on top of that then, we are going to have our roof level. So I'm actually gonna put this as the roof eave, eaves, okay? Oh, sorry, apologies, I'm, re I'm renaming the wrong thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, roof eaves level okay I'm not going to rename that corresponding view. actually I will for the moment I'm going to rename that corresponding view for the moment okay and this is going to be parapet level yep okay and here is going to be our second floor okay so that distance there, I want to have um, to the roof eave is going to be eleven two five, and then I actually want the eave to the parapet level to be fifteen hundred. So I put a dimension between the two, and now when I select it, I can actually just change the value of the dimension to make sure the level to level is correct, and that means I don't have to do the the, the mats if I don't want to, and uh, I can delete that then, okay? So again, as before, I'm just going to increase the grid slightly. So noting that they're all pinned, so I'm going to actually go back to my ground floor. I'm gonna select all my grids. I'm gonna press PN, or UP, apologies, to unpin them. And then I'm gonna go back to my elevation. I'm gonna select my grids, and I'm just going to increase them and decrease them a little bit, just so I'm given enough breathing room around the model data. And again, I'm gonna to go to reverse side and do the same. Increase them and decrease the overall height, okay? Finally, I'm just gonna rename this one um, Founds Level, Foundation, okay? And obviously that's not gonna be 1900 <laughs> below. Um, that's gonna be minus 900 in this instance, okay? Now, as you can see, we get a bit of a dog leg. We, we get a bit, a bit of an overlap. And the way to avoid the overlap is we can actually dog leg these. So you see this little, um, this little break indicator here, okay? That's, um, that adds the elbow to the dog leg. And as you can see, that drops that node and that node locally, okay? And then we can actually expand out either side around the text just to make it a little bit more presentable. And now we have kind of a presentable looking group of levels, okay? I'm just gonna expand these out on either side on the, the east-west direction as well. Give breathing room. And again, do the same on the north. And you will have to do this throughout. Now, truth be told, you can bind your levels and your grids to scope box and you can control them all with a scope box. I actually have a detailed video if you want to look up in the top right-hand corner there that goes into how scope boxes function and then using them you can actually select these elements and you can propagate extents and you can match the presentation that you've created in let's say the north elevation here in every corresponding view that looks the same okay so that's a hard kind of a concept to get around it's too detailed for this but just note that you can do this once and if you're intelligent about it you can actually publish it to all other views okay so that brings to close the step number four, which is to create the project levels. So step five is to put in your project base point. So um, the project base point is a tricky one. People get kind of confused about an awful lot. Generally, geolocation in Revit seems to cause a lot of grief, okay? But in this instance, if you don't have any specific survey information that's come in yet, um, if you're working ahead of survey information, let's say on a conceptual scheme or something like that, then you still want to assign a project base point. The reason why this is so important is because you can actually use it as a reference point for linking all other discipline data. Um, and it makes sense to do it before the, the information gets too dense in the project. You can do this across all your disciplines and very easily then you have your models coordinated going forward, okay? So I'm gonna go, if you look on the floor plans that we have here on the right-hand side, I'm going to go to the site plan, okay? And with the site plan, okay, I'm going to select you'll see we have this little kind of um, marker down here. If I select one of these elements, you will see 
the shared base point. Okay, so this, this is the project base point, this is the shared site. There's also an internal point, but I'm not going to go into that for this particular tutorial. Okay, so this is the project base point, and you can see it's got northings, eastings, and an elevation. Okay, and similarly, if I was to tab select, you will see below that is a little triangular indicator, and that's the survey point. Okay, and that again, if you think about it, that is your datum for your project base point to be set off of in the future. Okay, um, in this instance, we do not have either um, the, we don't have any survey information essentially. So what I want to do is I want to nominate a known point for the duration of the project that is not very likely to change. Okay, now that's an important criteria. What you want to do is establish something that you think is pretty much locked down. So if you're working off of an existing building and you're extending it, there's a lot of points of reference that probably aren't going to alter. And you can set up all of your project base points on your various disciplines to that one intersection, let's say, that's not going to change. In this, it's all, it's a complete new build, let's say. So there is the need to establish something that likely isn't going to change. And in this instance, I'm going to establish that, okay, A1, no matter what, or maybe C1, depending on the site orientation, is not going to change. So we have a site orientation, roughly, of this. And as you can see, I've highlighted A1 as the less, least likely element to change. Now, it could be C1. We could have a minimum distance from planning requirements or something that we have to keep from the boundary. And in which case, you might choose C1. So look, it's, it's project specific. In this instance, we're going to use A1. Okay. I can literally select these two elements together and move them onto the grid intersection. You'll notice suddenly the whole project's after shifting up. That's because I never actually stop the association of the current location of the project base point information and survey information from the data I've already created. So what I did when I moved that up is I actually moved the whole project information up as well, which is not what we want. So I'm going to control Z that to undo that. Okay. And what I'm going to say is you can see that you have this little clip. Okay. And again, I'm going to turn off the clip for the survey point as well. Now, what this means is I can freely move these within the model without the model moving with them. The point of this is to have a standard point across the model that if you relocate the model, the whole model relocates. But you actually need to unclip them first if you want to move them independent of the, the information you've already created. So now that they're unclipped, I'm going to select the move and I'm going to move them up to grid intersection A1. And you can see this time, nothing moved except the project base point and the survey point. Okay, again, I'm going to select the base point and I'm going to clip it. Just note, you can see the eastings and the northings are after updating. Okay. And the elevation remains at zero. Always set your project base point to your ground floor top of slab level unless you're told otherwise. So basically it means that before you have any datum level that will give you an elevation, you are working relative to your ground floor level. And that means all your levels are relative to that ground floor level. It's just a really good way of keeping control on the building heights and the respective geometry that you need to extrude up and down relative to the ground. And that means all you need to do is find out what your top of finished slab level is going to be relative to your survey, change that one value and you're sorted. Okay. And again, I'm just going to tab select again, and I'm going to pick the survey point and I'm going to do that. Okay. And now we've basically relocated our project base point. And it means any external referencing models that are going to come into this that we're going to link to. If we establish the same point, the same grids, the same levels that are pertinent to the discipline, then everything will just automatically overlay if we do auto argent origin or auto project base point. It depends. Okay. So that was step five, which was to how to assign your project base point. So step six is to create your standard views and your underlays. Okay, so this is an interesting one. In this example that we've already presented, when we were creating our levels, the views were automatically being created. So as you can see on the floor plans on the right hand side, we've already loosely populated all of our floor plans. Okay, but this isn't always the instance. It depends on the way that the levels are created. Um, the level indicators as a default, they're blue when there's a view associated to them and they're black when there's not. So that's just something to be cognizant of. You can see here on the structural plans that we've only got a few of them, for example. So not every level is deemed a structural level at the moment. So it's just to understand that levels have different properties that can create views, okay? Um, and in this instance, what we're gonna do is I'm gonna actually delete our 
Roof seized, power pit, uh, second floor foundation, and first floor plans. And I'm gonna go through the process of creating all them, which you know, okay? So all those plans are gone, okay? And you can see all the levels are still present. So nothing has changed about the, the levels. Nothing has been affected about the levels just because we've deleted the associated plan views, okay? But what we can do now is we can go to our view tab and under plan views, we can create a floor plan, okay? And here you can see, do not duplicate existing views. So you can turn that on and off depending if you want to create a new existing view or not, okay? So in this instance, I'm going to leave that active and I'm literally going to select all of these. The first floor, the foundation, the parapet level, the roof eaves, and the second floor. And we're gonna create a new view for all of these, okay? So when I press okay, quite simply on the right-hand side, you're gonna see all those views populate, okay? Now, what's interesting is people never really understand what order they should model their buildings in. Should they start in the foundation? Should they start with the ground floor? Should they start with the first floor? Should they start in the 3D view and develop the external envelope? There's a lot of different criteria that could be considered the best way to start depending on the project. In my opinion, the best way to start is project dependent in terms of modeling, but setting up your underlays is not project dependent. There's actually an intelligent way of doing it. Each view can reference a view below or a view above if you wish. Okay, and that's something to understand. So as you can see on the ground floor here, okay, you can see that on the left-hand side, we have all of this information. Okay, and looking for the underlay segment, where is it? It's escaping me. <laughs> Sorry, underlay here, apologies. Um, late night last night, uh, we have the, the range base level, okay? And what we can do is we can actually change that, okay? So being in the ground floor, I can actually create a foundation underlay. Now, what's difficult here is we actually can't see anything, okay? And the reason we can't see anything is because we haven't actually populated any of the model data yet, okay? But you can see that the top of the range, this gives us the range base level, okay, which is the foundation level. Then it gives a top, which is the, the, the ground floor, okay? And you can set the orientation to look down or to look up, depending, okay? So what's interesting about this, though, is I can go into the foundation level, and under that, I can pick ground floor, and you can see that the top of that is first floor and saying to look down. So I can say, look up, look down, okay? I'm gonna look down, I'm still gonna treat it as if we're looking down upon it, okay? So this is still not presenting any information, okay? But if we go to the ground floor, and I, let's say, generate a series of walls, okay? So I'm gonna press WA, okay? And I'm gonna set the top of my wall constraint to output level, okay? And I'm going to select chain, I'm going to leave that particular block work wall that we've assigned, okay? And with this, I'm going to join the location line. I'm going to say um, core center line. And I'm gonna put the core center line on the grid boundaries, okay? So I'm gonna do a rectangle and I'm going to draw directly to the grids, okay? As you can see, the core, the inner wall is now aligned to the grid because the inner wall is deemed the core. When you go into the structural buildup, you can see that the core boundary is this structural wall only, okay? So when you draw to the core center line, you will draw to the, the, the structural center line provided you've got your, your element assemblies in the correct sequence, okay? What's brilliant about this is, let's say if I went and offset all these walls by 500 for argument's sake, Okay, I can actually align these walls to the grids from the core center line and lock them. And again, tab until I get the core center line, lock, align to the grid, tab until you select the core center line, lock, and align to grid, tab until you get the core center line, and lock. Okay, and this means what we've done is we've locked our walls to the grids. So if I unpin that grid, okay, I can drag the grid line and the wall will always stay adhered to the grid. And more importantly, the structural element of the wall is attached to the grid, okay? That's just something to be cognizant of. So I've undone them and that is now pinned again, okay? So everything is back as it should be, okay? 
So in the ground floor, we've populated this. And what we can see is our, our full um, wall build up all the way to parapet. In this instance, however, we want to see the ground floor in the foundation plan, okay? So that we can work and make sure that our walls, both our external and our internal, let's say. So let's say I'm gonna pick up the internal partition and I'm just going to draw a notional series of um, walls there, just for argument's sake, just to make it clear, okay? So we've actually got the first floor walls there present as well, okay? So I can go down to the foundation view and because I have set the underlay to ground floor all the way up to the first floor. Looking down on our foundation plan, we can now see the information above that we can then model out against. So I can actually press WA here for the wall and I can go to wall foundation 440 block work. I can pick the core center line, okay? And again, much the same way as previous, I can draw that across the grid intersections as such. And now I have a foundation. Now, obviously this hasn't been designed out, this rising wall, but I have a foundation wall in place. And then I can go into my structural tab and create our wall-based Give me a moment, I'm just gonna set that minus 500. Minus 500 so we can actually see our new founts. And there you go. So now I've got a strip foundation under the rising wall, under the the um, the ground floor walls, let's say, okay? So in 3D space, you can see that that's all arranged now, okay? Um, but most importantly then, once I'm done with that underlay here, I can literally just set that to none again on the left-hand side, okay? And what we're seeing, because the view range is going up, I can actually change that view range there to, let's say, um, zero and zero. So we're only getting what's on the found level. And now you can see that we have the foundation, just the strip, okay? Again, I could go back and change that to 300 and 300. And you'll see that we have the rising wall there, okay? But again, I can go ahead and turn on that underlay for the ground floor at any time, even though the view range doesn't go that high. So setting up your, your underlays so that you can see the information pertinent to the levels above and below is a really, really powerful thing. I can now go onto the ground floor, okay, and do the same. You can see that we have the foundation level, okay, um, to, the, to the top of the foundation level, basically. So what we can see, although we can't select it, is we can actually see that inner line of the rising wall from the foundation. So again, if you have a linked structural model, that has the levels correctly aligned to, let's say, your model, and everything is geolocated correctly, you could set the underlay to the foundation level with the structural um, model visibility turned on, and you will see the structural model underlay. So if you're populating architectural walls, you can find where the structure is lying below. It's just a consideration to know, okay? Um, so that is Step six, which is how to create your standard views and how to assign the sensible underlays on a per view basis. Step seven, geolocate your project. So I need to preface this first of all to say that you may be at a point in the project that you don't necessarily have survey information or site information available to you. You may be doing a conceptual design scheme off of the back of Google Maps or something like that. That is not the point to do this exercise then. This exercise is for when you actually have the survey data from the site, and you can set out relative to a known um, coordinate system for your area. For example, in Ireland, it's the Irish Transverse Marcator or the ITM coordinates, okay? It's gonna vary depending on where you are in the world. This is a point to do the moment you get your survey data, not beforehand, okay? Um, so with that in mind, you can do this at any point in the project. The earlier in the project you can do it, the better, because it means that it gives you more time to have all your disciplines developed off the back of this already located, rather than having to go and push the coordinate system onto all your links down the line, okay? Um, so to start, I'm in the site plan here, and you can see that I have the, uh, the survey point and the project base point visible. If they're not visible for you, you go into your visibility graphics, and you go down to site, under visibility graphics, sorry, apologies, where are you hiding? 
um, and you can turn on your project base point and your survey point there. Okay. Now, from there, what we want to do is we want to select our survey point. So I tab selected there, and I'm going to change the clip state. I'm going to unclip that. And I'm going to change the nordings and eastings on this to zero, zero, respectively. Okay. And as you can see, that's loosely located it back to where we had it at the start of the video. I'm also going to clip that there now, so that cements that in place. Your datum level is always relative to zero, really, unless you have a sp project specific datum that migrates it closer to the building. But let's just assume in this instance, we're working off of zero, zero, zero. Okay. Then on our project base point, now we can actually start putting in the values that we want. Okay. So I want to go to a sample image there to explain what we're doing with the site. Okay. So this is a theoretical site in a theoretical location that doesn't exist. All right. But it should give you the, uh, the bones of what you need. Okay. So as you can see, we have our true north direction here and desired project north is at 25 degrees from that. We also have our nordings and eastings for where we want our intersection at the grid A1 to be or our project base point, as well as our final desired level for the ground floor top of slab level. OK, so that's the ground floor elevation is at 69.125 meters. OK, so we have 720,000. 765,000 and 69.125. These values here, just know they're notional. They will change depending on where you are in the world. So from that, going back to the model, okay, I'm going to put my Nordings at 720,000 respectively, and the model will disappear into the ether. If you double click your middle mouse wheel, you will find where the model's gone in space. It may be very, very far away, but you will see it. <laughs> okay. And then if you come in, you select the same point again, and you change your east-west direction. That was 765,000, I believe. I'm going to press enter. Again, it's disappeared. Middle mouse wheel to zoom extents, and then you'll find your project. Finally, because we set our project base point at the same level as our top of floor slab level when we started the project, we can now assign the elevation to that that we want and we want 69.125 or in millimeters which is the base unit for the autodesk and um, default template i'm going to press 69125 millimeters and press enter now what's interesting about that is you can see everything has relocated from the project relative to the survey point so that's our zero zero and everything is relative to that okay Finally, if you don't want to uh, be looking at your view like that on your site plan, you can crop your extents here. So when you zoom extents, it'll locate in, but the, just note that you still also need to turn on your annotation crop for that. But you will always zoom if the survey is visible, if the survey point. So you should go into your site information then, and you should probably turn off the visibility of your survey point. So that when you zoom extents, you'll zoom into your model each time when you're on your site plan. Okay. I also want to note that this is not set up to any kind of particular orientation. You can see that this is set up to project north or true north. Okay. But you can see there's no variation yet because there hasn't been any rotation placed. Okay. So now that we've placed loosely um, our, well, not loosely, actually, accurately, we've placed our relative northings, eastings, we can now look at our elevations and update the reporting information from our elevations. So when we go into our north elevation here, you can see that our, our levels are not reporting the necessary level change relative to the survey point. And that's because we actually have to instruct them to do that. So in our level information here and under edit type, we can select whether they reference the project base point, which is the zero and everything is relative to the top of slab as, as we've earlier discussed or the survey point. And when we press survey point, you can see it's going to update to report our 69125 and everything then is relative down to our site data. Okay. So because of the scale of the projects that I tend to work on, we always reference our levels back to the datum, to the known uh, survey point. Um, due to the way that the setting out techniques and stuff, we can automate a lot of that on site with GPS equipment and that kind of stuff. We can understand the relative values but if you're doing something like a domestic project, you may want to keep your reporting levels um, on your standard elevations relative to zero um, for construction drawings and relative to the survey information, let's say for um, 
planning drawings, for example, so they understand the relative elevation, okay? Um, so that's just consideration. Just to understand, you can also duplicate and create a new level type that will report, let's say, your relative to your project base point, and you can have a second level type, and you could change your levels presentation on a per view basis, if you wish, okay? Um, so following on from that, um, we have now updated our levels and we have updated the relative elevation and the northings and eastings. But one thing we haven't done is we haven't given the project north versus true north rotation. Okay. So going back to the site plan on the project north, I'm going to go to coordinates. Okay. And you'll see that we can acquire published coordinates and that kind of stuff, but that's not what we want. Under position, we can say rotate true north. Okay. View must be rotated to north, available only in plan views. Modify the views properties to use a different view. Okay, so what this is telling me is I can't rotate the true north location yet because I don't have a view, aka the view I'm on, set to show true north. Okay, so when I come back here, I am going to go to the orientation on the project, on the floor plan properties, sorry, and I'm going to select true north. Okay. From that then, on the position, I'm going to rotate true north, and from here, I'm going to rotate 25. So you can see, it picks the center of rotation, and you rotate at 25 degrees. Now, if you look at that, that doesn't look correct, does it? If we look at the site plan, you can see I've gone in the opposite direction, okay? But the interesting thing about that is our true north direction is actually facing so if you imagine the orientation of our building okay the true north is basically up up off the top left corner so if we rotate from the center in that same direction we're actually going to do the inverse of what we wanted okay so i'm going to control z that and under under the position settings i'm going to go rotate true north and I'll rotate 25 in this direction okay and now that's looking a little bit more sensible isn't it on our site plan though, we can then, after the fact, change whether we go to Project North or True North. So our site drawing should always show us our True North orientation. And we now know that this building is oriented correctly in line with what we want. Again, we can go to any one of our other plans. And because they're all set to Project North, they stay, they stay kind of square. Um, to the views that you're working on everything is nice and perpendicular whereas on our site plan we now have true north rotation in place for the project duration so that's basically a very quick overview of how to uh, geolocate your project and um, i will do a more detailed video on this and maybe i'll do a full amalgamation of multiple disciplinary models into one f let's say not necessarily a federated model from the novice work sense but one combined um Revit project that has multiple links that are all geolocated and correct relative to one another. I think we'll do that in the near future, so hang tight for that, okay? Step eight, set up your design options. So depending on the nature of the project that you have, you may need to create design options. An example of that may be that you have a known building footprint, but within that building footprint, you want to test different arrangements with the client to see what best suits their needs, let's say, or their brief, okay? So let's say these internal wall layouts, you may want two or three variations of this to feed to the client and to get feedback from, okay? Um, historically in CAD, you may create multiple individual CAD files for this or control it with layers turning on and off. But in this instance, we can actually control it all natively within the one project. And um, the way to do that is through design options. Now, I have a much more detailed breakdown of design options in the top right corner. I can never get the direction right um, when I'm doing the mirrored. So press the I button there and it will send you a link to design options if you want to know more about them in a bit of detail. But in this instance, I'm just going to show how you can create the framework for design options, not necessarily how to assign your design options. Okay. So if you go into your manage tab, under design options, you'll see that the design options dialog there. And when you open it, there's nothing. It says you are now editing the main model. So everything as a default is added to the main model. In this set, we want to press new, okay, under option set. And this gives us basically a container for multiple design options to be placed in. And we have as a default option set one primary, okay. And then under option, we can select new, and that would be our option two and new, and that would be our option three, okay? And 
As you can see, there's been no change to the geometry, but we actually have multiple options available, design options available below. So let's say, for example, I wanted to select these walls. Okay, I can select those walls and I can pop them into option set one primary. Okay. Oh, sorry, my apologies. I did that a little bit incorrectly. Um, I was meant to go back to manage add to set and I can add them to option set one, for example. Okay. So nothing changes because option set one is set as primary. Okay. And all you can see is the amalgamation of main model and primary as a default. But if I go down here and I change to option two, you will see that that information has disappeared because it's only pertinent to the main model and the, the option set one, but it's not present on option set two. So that's a loose introduction of how to set up your design options in Revit. Step number nine is create your phasing for the project. So um, depending again on the type of project you have, all Revit projects have phasing technically in the sense that by default, there's an existing and a proposed phase present. Most people just get started drafting in what's called the new construction phase as a default, and they don't even recognize that there's, there's, there's phases when they're starting out. But this is something that um, can, can trip people up, okay? So if you have an existing building that you're making additions to, or you have to do enabling works to enable the, the, the project to proceed, or you have multiple phases of works for a proposed project, you need to introduce your project phasing. This is not a catch-all. You don't need to introduce phasing as a default um, or additional phases as a default. It's more just to be considered that they're there and understand your project context and how to introduce them if you need them. I have two very detailed videos on phasing. The primary one there, again, is in the top right corner on the eye. Make sure to look it up and um, yeah, we'll get into it. Okay, so looking at Phasing very briefly, um, please go view that other video, it's very detailed and most people seem to have gotten a grasp of it after they've watched it. But if you go into the phasing information here, the way to set it up is if you go to manage tab, okay, you can go to phases under the phasing tab, okay. And you will see as default, as I said, there's an existing new construction phase, okay. But you may have new construction phase one, phase two, phase three, depending. And what you can do is you can actually add um, additional phases into any project. The one thing I will always make sure to note is you do not need a demolition phase. The demolition or enabling works presentation is controlled by phase filters. Okay, so you can see we have new construction. Okay, I want to introduce, I'm going to call that phase one. Okay, and then after, and I'm going to call that phase two, and that automatically updates. Okay, so I've actually introduced an additional phase to the project now. Okay. In the phase filters, you can see that these are the controls as default to present the information. So the show previous phase, for example, does not show any new geometry belonging to the phase you're looking at. It does not show, um, it shows existing as overridden, demolished as not displayed, and temporary as not displayed. These are kind of hard things to explain. To understand, basically, your view as a default is set to a phase, okay? So I didn't save the settings there. So you can see that I still have new construction, okay? But as a default, your phase filters are specific to the presentation of the view phase that you are showing, okay? A little bit convoluted. Again, I advise check out that video to see the workflow, okay? But going back to our manage tab, I'm gonna to go to phases. I'm just going to reintroduce those phases that I didn't save, okay? Um, so that's phase one, and then I'm gonna put another one afterwards. Phase filters are okay. And then the graphic overrides, you can change how the various phase filters interact with the geometry to present the geometry, okay? So in this instance, I'm not happy that the demolished is automatically on a black dash line. I'm actually going to change that to red. And I'm also going to change that to red. On our cut patterns, I'm gonna change them also to red. And uh, press OK. And on the projection surface pattern, I'm also going to change it to red. And that means no matter where you're cutting through, your demo layer will show as red. Okay. So I'm going to press apply. I'm going to press OK. And as you can see, our project is on phase one there because that was the intermediate phase, the new construction phase that we originally drafted on. But in the ground floor plan here, for example, so I'm going to rename that ground floor and I'm going to call that 
let's say phase one. Sorry. Do I want to rename the corresponding views in this instance? This is what I was getting at earlier on in the video where I said that it can get very convoluted when you keep renaming views or adding views or duplicating views. So in this instance, I'm going to press no. Okay. And I'm also going to duplicate this view with detailing and I'm going to rename that view phase two. Okay. Phase two. Now, looking down when I'm in phase two here on the left hand side, you can see under the view properties that the phase for the view is set to phase two. I'm going to set that to phase phase one. I'm going to set that to phase two. And I want you to look at the geometry that's been created and what happens to it. So when I press phase two, you can see it grays out. It becomes less visible, less strong. Okay. And on the previous, I'm going to say previous and new. Okay. So with that, what we have is we've kind of grayscaled out the existing geometry. And now I can come in here, I can press wall. Okay. And I'm going to draw in a new wall construction from here to here. Oh. Not that wall or not. Um, give me a second. I'm going to pick, draw a new wall construction from here to here. Okay. And as you can see, that's darker than the default around it. But I'm also, because I'm intersecting that wall now, I'm going to tab to select. No, I can't select that wall in the previous phase. No. Oh, was that? Sorry, that's on primary set one. Apologies. So on the primary set one, okay. Um, on the option set, I'm going to set that phase demolished to phase two. So in phase two of works, that gets demolished. Okay. And then I'm going to go back to the main model option here. So design options combined with phasing can become very confusing. Make sure if you're putting together a strategy for your model and you have design options and phasing that you outline the strategy in a document that can be passed upon around the, the entire design team. If you are not the one who's going to be anchoring the project. If you're anchoring the project the whole time or you're working solo, you, ha you have an understanding of what's happening within the model, but you really need to be descriptive for any other user who's going to come in after you or make edits if it's getting passed on to another technician or, or, or architect or something, okay? Um, so now we put in a proposed wall, you'll notice that we can't see the demolished wall, okay? But what I can do is I can duplicate with detail and again, our phase two, and I'm gonna rename this and I'm gonna call it ground floor phase phase two enabling works okay basically demolition for phase two and under the phase filters i can show previous and demo and now you will see the dash line for the wall that's been constructed that the wall has been dem demolished sorry and the wall is being constructed is no longer available because we've changed what the actual the um phasing filters are allowing us to show okay so again, if we go, I've, sh I've said show previous and demo, and here you can see that the new geometry is not displayed, that the existing is overridden, AKA it's grayscale, okay? The demolish is overridden, AKA it has gone to the demolished presentation of, of line styles, and finally the temporary items are not displayed. So that's a very, very quick overview of how you can set up your phasing for your project in particular, okay? So that concludes a, a, a long and hopefully sufficiently detailed video for, for everyone who may be starting out in Revit and just needs to get a footing on the best approaches to, to kick off a model with, okay? It's not about just sitting down and immediately drawing the walls. If you put the framework for the model in place first, then everyone you're contending with afterwards, everyone you have to um, design alongside and coordinate with, they'll have an easier life for it. You'll look more professional as a result and you'll be able to manage the project a little bit better. Now, there's more management strategies into maintaining the integrity of the file to go through. You know, we didn't. I didn't go through um, project browser organization, for example. I didn't go through, um, you know, sheet and view organization. I didn't go through view templates, any of that kind of thing. But really, the fundamental steps that I outlined there are your initiation steps, basically, instigation steps for every model that you start. Um, give or take maybe one or two instances on project particulars. So if you can habitualize them, you will have every model that you start up and running within a matter of minutes. That was a very long minute exercise to explain it, but the reality of the actual production to get to that point is very, very, very quick. Okay. So I'll have a corresponding blog post with this all broken down into subsequent steps. 
to uh, go to go for you to go over and just kind of read through at a more linear slow pace if you wish um that'll be over on 8020 bim.com i have a little support page now as well over on buy me a coffee if you want to get me a coffee or a beer or something just to justify the late nights you're more than welcome to i won't stop you to um i am starting to set up a membership portal as well anyone who'd like to become a member I'll have a Discord chat available. They can come in, they can ask questions, all that kind of stuff. I just want to kind of harbor a bit of a community, really, and get a bit of feedback on what, what people would like to, to learn about, more so than me assuming what people would like to learn about. Um, so, yeah, that's it. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope, fair play to you if you lasted this long. <laughs> I barely did. And um, look, I'll see you for the next one. Mind yourselves, be safe. Take care.